Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Off Script with Pastor Jared. And Aaron the intern. He's here. <laughs> uh, the results, uh, the, the reviews were so high from last time uh, that we just had to bring it back. Uh, so today I want to talk about a topic that I'm super interested in, have always been interested in, and I'll admit to you, I don't know everything about it. It's a pretty big field, um, but I thought, man, I need somebody who can help me, who can bounce some thoughts off, and so I brought in Aaron because he's got a little bit of a uh, run-in with the topic. Yeah. He's pretty aware of the topic that I want to talk about today, probably more than I am. Uh, I mean, I, I've been around and I've read. Aaron's had some direct run-in with yeah. it more than me, so uh, probably... I think you can help me, buddy. Yeah, I, I, can, can. I can try my best. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the topic of today is fundamentalism. Uh, and so I'm going to call it the lingering effects of fundamentalism. And uh, we really need to define that because it's probably one of those words that can mean whatever you want it mm-hmm. to mean. So um, what I'm getting at is this. In the SBC world that we live in, we live in the Southern Baptist world, um, I would say most Southern Baptists would not define themselves today as fundamentalists. Would you agree with that? Yes, by term, they wouldn't call themselves fundamentalists. Okay, so uh, at the same time, I think the fundamentalist movement, and, and by that I mean sort of what's contained in the independent fundamental Baptist world, because there's independent, there's fundamental Muslims, there's fundamental Mormons, there's right. there's fundamentalism everywhere. I'm just talking about this Baptist world, okay? In that world, uh, I think fundamentalism has played a massive role in shaping the Southern Baptist of today, Mm -hmm. and most Baptists, Southern Baptists, have no idea how much it really has played in. Uh, A lot of people do and say things that they don't know why, and it's come from a fundamental Baptist background. Yeah. So I want to give what hopefully is a little f- fair and balanced, uh, sorry for the Fox News uh, line there, <laughs> a fair and balanced, uh, some good, some bad in my perspective. But then Aaron, you have the freedom to say whatever you want. Whatever I want. Yep. If you if you want to be completely <laughs> pro, you can be completely pro. Okay. But um, let's go back to kind of where the, the term came from. And again, I'm not a complete expert, but I have read and watched some things. All right. So the word fundamentalist, as far as I can tell, came from the early and mid 1900s, 1910s, um, when America as a society was rushing toward modernism, a, the science movement um, evolution was massively becoming accepted and, and changing the landscape of intellectualism in America, there was uh, commissioned this series of articles and essays by Christian pastors and professors to combat these views. And these were called the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. So this was done like 1910 to 1915 and funded by a super rich Presbyterian. Somehow the Presbyterians always have the money. I don't know if you ever noticed that. (laughs) Uh, The Baptists never could quite get it. But, um, Funded by the Presbyterians to do a a massive project where over five years, uh, really scholarly essays were written to combat a lot of these incoming, uh, higher critical, liberal theologies, Mm. mostly coming out of Europe. Um, Germany had, had, out of their universities, had produced a lot of really liberal theology that was starting to infect the American church. Right. It had already infected Spurgeon's church by this time and all of Britain. It was coming our way. Okay, so these guys built a wall and tried to keep some of it out. Is that your understanding? Yeah, for sure. That's okay. how it started. Yeah. Okay. So I would say good start. Yeah, for right? sure. So even today when you ask fundamentalists what the hallmarks of what they believe are. I, found, I looked it up. This is what I most often saw, okay? Uh, hallmarks of original fundamentalism mm-hmm. would be, um, looking for it. Oh, the inerrancy of scripture, uh, miracles are for real, uh, substitutionary atonement of Christ, the virgin birth is real, and the bodily resurrection of Christ. Amen. So, yeah, I mean, I amen. All those yeah. things are, are good and true, and those, uh, if those are the fundamentals, 
I'm a fundamentalist. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So if that's what we're saying, great. Um, so the case that I guess I would make is that something happened because when you look, just my opinion, when you look at independent fundamental Baptist today, we are different than they are in a lot of ways. Much different, yeah. Uh, it doesn't feel the same. If you go to a Southern Baptist church that's not fundamentalist, and then you go to a, even I would say like Kirby Woods, we are not fundamentalist, but we're really conservative. Our theology is conservative. We're, you know, we're not woke, all that stuff, okay? Yeah. So if you go to Kirby Woods versus an independent fundamental Baptist church, it feels different. Mm-hmm. And yet we would both amen that list. Right. All those things are good. So something happened. Mm-hmm. When do you feel like that something began to, to go astray? Well, I, I think, and we, we've talked about this before, I think the uh, kind of big splitting off uh, between Southern Baptists and really the big growth in independent Baptists happened, uh, as we were talking about the other day, in the early 70s, when the SBC was really getting flooded with liberal theology. And uh, if you allow me to kind of go on a rant for a second, you can rant. Uh, so in the in the Southern Baptist Convention, from what I understand, uh, there were the conservatives who held to all the points uh, that we amend earlier and still would amen, and then there were the liberals who were being affected uh, by liberal theology and losing their stance for inerrancy of Scripture and other things like that. And there there were two different groups of the conservatives. So all of them considered themselves fundamentalists. They affirmed the fundamentals of scripture, but there's a group that is often called the anti-conventionalist and the anti-conventionalist. I kind of think of it as maybe the church in England, when everyone was coming out of there and coming over to America, there are people who want to separate and there are people who want to improve the church and fix the church. So I'm learning something in the SBC in the early seventies, there are the people who are anti-conventionalists and want to leave the convention. And I think if I'm right, that's where a large majority of independent fundamental Baptist churches, like specifically made a distinction. Like we're not Southern Baptist, we're independent fundamental Baptist. Okay. And then there is a group, which we would be part of now conservative Southern Baptists who stayed. And through the years, the liberals and the SBC would, attack the conservatives saying, oh, you are just a bunch of fundamentalists and anti-conventionalists. And we're like, well, no, we're fundamentalists. We believe in the Nancy of scripture, but no, we're also not going to leave the SBC behind. Okay. So if that's true, then what that would mean is that up until that point, it was kind of all, we were all together or at least. It, yeah. There wasn't enough difference to have to separate and distinguish yourself from the SBC or Okay. Whatnot. So if that's true, then that would explain, we kind of have a, uh, a heritage that's similar up to a point and then it split. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, so I had written down a couple things that just from my reading and listening to other people, it seems like our major, uh, milestones in the fundamental, in the movement up till the seventies. Cause I think okay. you're right. That's correct. Um, so number one, Prohibition. I think that is extremely important to the fundamentalist mindset. And I'll say, I'm not an alcohol guy, so I don't have any attachment to this. But at the same time, you can tell this is a major pinch point for fundamentalists, that this act of drinking alcohol, uh, who was that guy, the sermon we were listening to with the hand chop? Billy Sunday. The karate chop. Yeah, Billy Sunday. (laughs) Um, You know, he... That was his message. I right. mean, he was a preacher of the time, but that was his message. Was mm-hmm. and I think fundamentalists um, felt like they got a huge win when prohibition came, and a lot of them said it's the preaching of Billy Sunday that possibly like pushed this to happen because right. it was so prolific. And then when it went backwards, I think they began to feel like a massive loss when it when it was reversed and we went back away from prohibition. And I think that began to cause some more separation. Like they began to pull back from the world even harder because they thought they were winning. Then boom, a law changed out from under them. So I think that's burned into the mind. Um, I know on in some way the Scopes Monkey Trial oh, yeah, that's a is, is a part of this. I don't. Yeah. I'll be honest. I don't completely understand it, uh, but 
uh, in some way, the Scopes Monkey Trial is uh, huge to the fundamentalist history. Mm-hmm. I think, so let me give you what my revisionist history of what I've heard, and you tell me if it's what you've heard. On paper, I think the fundamentalist side won the debate, but in public opinion, lost the debate of the Scopes Monkey Trial, and that that they came away looking worse after that. Is that what you're... I'm, I'm not fully sure ultimately who uh, won, but I do know in public opinion, uh, it definitely made them stand out even more so. Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a spectacle. Anybody listening should go Google the Scopes Monkey Trial, Clarence Darrow or, or whoever from yeah. the 20s. Um, a small town in Tennessee became a circus right. for Bryan College. Or, yeah, for yeah. Uh, was it Dayton, Dayton, Tennessee? A small town in Tennessee became just a circus. Uh, it was about teaching evolution or creation in school, and it yeah. blew up. And so this became a big thing. I think that was a huge moment. My third one is Billy Graham. Okay. How do fundamentalists feel about Billy Graham? It it depends on the fundamentalist I guess you ask uh, I would say in my experience it's a negative outlook on Billy Graham so uh, a lot of the controversy and I don't know all about it but there's controversy between Billy Graham and Bob Jones Sr. who was uh, a big name in the independent fundamental Baptist world and I mean Bob Jones University is still a very large university uh, also I know Billy Graham was an ecumenist uh, yeah. and uh Obviously, I'm not the biggest fan of ecumenists and independent fundamental Baptists. Definitely, we're not. So uh, I remember one time uh, in high school, I actually wrote a paper on Billy Graham uh, just because, I mean, I admire the guy for uh, all the you know evangelism and uh, the gospel that he spread. Um, but yeah, big negative on his life. I would say I disagreed with his ecumenicism, and I think that's a big thing that they disagreed with as well. Yeah. You know, the more I look back at Billy Graham, I see a lot of problems with what he did. Mm-hmm. I probably would would be uh, agreeing with some of the points that fundamentalists have. You right. know, um, a lot of their issues were were like Billy Graham would host these big crusades, and then um, the people he would have as counselors at the front yeah. would be from all different faiths. You yeah, know, and like, that's where the ecumenicism comes. Right. In, right. It's like, well, someone wants to be saved. Okay. Well, what background are you? Well, I grew up Methodist. Okay. Get the Methodist counselor. Yeah. Uh, uh, Baptist. Oh, we'll get the Baptist counselor, and, mm-hmm. and so. A lot of people had a problem with that because it was so big tent um, in in his approach. And so I think you'll find Billy Graham is sort of a pinch point for people. Um, But I agree with some of their problems with Billy Graham. I mean, he said some things even uh, that are concerning to me now looking back at Billy Graham, Mm -hmm. you know, about people who've never heard the gospel being saved and and things like that. So anyway, I'll let y'all YouTube those on your own. (laughs) But um, yeah, I think by the time... Those are all in the background. Um, and then by the time you get to the 70s and then those splits are beginning to happen. And, and what makes it hard is that the SBC did turn back conservative. Mm-hmm. They won their battle, which is pretty rare to happen uh, when liberalism gets in. Typically, you lose. Um, but the SBC won it back over. It took about a decade or two, got back conservative. Um, and so then you kind of had but they had already split. They were already doing their separate things. So here we are today. Let me give you a list, okay? When you when I look at what I think of as f- some hallmarks of fundamentalist churches, um, sadly, I don't think of the conservative theology. I right. think of some other things. Mm-hmm. So let me give you some of the other things, and you tell me this is true or that's a fabrication yeah. of your mind. The stereotype. That's yeah, I'm going to give over. you stereotypes. Okay. Okay. And you tell me true or fabrication of your mind. All right. Okay. In all honesty. Um, and this is in no particular order, ladies and gentlemen, just what I, what I rapid fire thought of. Okay. Um, fundamentalists are definitely anti cards and gambling, even if not for money. It depends on the fundamentalists you ask, but I know some, so I'll say yes. Okay. Uh, Rock music is always bad. A hundred percent. It's of the devil. Okay. And, well, and Christian rock music too. Yeah. Not just rock music. Christian so like, music. so like mercy me. Oh yeah. Casting no. crowns. Yeah. No. Chris Tomlin. Yeah. The most mild. <laughs> yeah. From the pit of hell, man. That's yeah. <laughs> 
Can you? Do you know why? I, I really struggled. I mean, is it the drums? If, if you want me, the beats. Can I be? Can I be completely straightforward? Uh, I think the <laughs> listeners at home would appreciate that. Okay, so one thing that I was taught in uh, Bible class at one point was that CCM music, like even what we would play in Kirby at Kirby in the early two thousands, that it created in your body the beats of the music created quote sexual pulsations that would be used by the devil okay uh, to kind of steer you away so it was it's in the beat of the song that distracts you from Christ which is perhaps why uh, if I'm if I'm not wrong a lot of the old hymns and kind of the songs that they would sing are to a beat that's not really yeah, they're easy not dance to music. groove to. They yeah. got a little bounce. They've got sort of a uh, like almost organ bounce to it. Mm. Dun, 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 yeah. dun, dun, you know, sort of yeah. like that. Okay. Well, that's weird. I mean, yeah. I, uh, I mean, that's what I was taught or told by people. I mean, that's, but okay. So the guitars, drums, no, yeah. these are no, no's no, no's. Okay. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes some guitars are okay. An acoustic guitar, yeah. not an electric guitar. And well, I have seen some churches use a bass electric guitar, so they plug in the mm. bass. Okay, but it's not preferred. So to me, that's a hallmark. If I go to those churches, I'm expecting a piano on the left and an organ on the right. Yes. Okay. Um, a deep love of choirs. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I love choirs too. Sure. I, mm. I, I got no problem with choirs, but we were joking about this. I, I'm going to say, say it. Not particular where we're we talking about, but. Some churches that don't have the personnel for a choir mm-hmm. will still try, like to their dying like, breath, like two person yeah, choir. Yeah, like <laughs> it, even if you've got like five, four, three people that are interested in the choir, they would still have it. When mm-hmm. when we would probably say, just hey, get out on stage and sing. Together. Let's just put you know our be a, more of a yeah. praise team up front, or mm-hmm. let's sing to sing to a track or something. I mean, if we don't have it, let's not push push right. it and make it try to happen. But for them, it's convictional to have a choir. Right. It's not convictional. just preference. It's almost convictional. You need a choir. Yeah. Right. Okay. I think so. Um, you ever see um, screens or is it all, is it hymn books only? Screens. Screens are used. You can get some yeah. screens. I'm okay. sure there's some out there that are extreme that wouldn't, but yeah, screens right. are used. I think of suits and ties. Yes, Am I right ties. on that? Yeah. Um, if I give a quick story on that. Please. Uh, one time I was visiting a uh, independent fundamental Baptist, very, very high church, uh, church, couple thousand people, you know, super tall, nice ceilings with massive chandeliers who, who knows how many thousands of dollars they're worth. And uh, so I decided going to this church visiting for that Sunday um, with a, another family that I would uh, bring, you know, a button down and a bow tie oh. and just kind of dress out a little bit. So I show up and immediately I feel underdressed in my bow tie. <laughs> in the bow tie? Yeah, I am the only person. I look around the whole place and people are giving me some weird looks here and there. I'm the only person in there without a suit coat on. Wow. And uh, I felt very underdressed. So definitely suit and tie. Underdressed a with a bow tie. Hallmark. Not at all churches. I know some who wear, you know, polos and stuff, but okay. especially at the high church. Uh, fundamentalist. Okay. Definitely. Under so that suit and tie look is definitely oh, yeah. prevalent. And then the preacher will, will wear a suit and tie. Okay. There's no question about it. Um, clean shaven. Are we, are we, or are beards? I, again, I know some more extreme ones, the same church that I wore the bow tie to. I've heard taught from the pulpit that if you wear a beard, you're ashamed of the image of God because you're covering up your face. Wow. See, so can I just say to extremes. me, to me, that issue comes from um, military culture yeah. not from not from the bible or anything yeah. and the problem if you really look into it the problem with that is when jesus was being led to the cross they, they plucked what they pluck out his beard okay. so if he didn't you know that's yeah. a problem i just think that comes from a generation where a lot of men were in the military mm-hmm. um in the 40s they mm-hmm. went they fought in world war ii and then they right. came home and they took that clean shaven thing as a, a a way to do it yeah um again convictional not preference yeah. yeah i mean spurgeon had a big fat beard yeah right and you'd like to have that kind of beard, wouldn't yeah, you? Yeah, I wish. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Insisting on the King James Version? Yes, uh, King James only. Uh, they'll even put that, I've seen churches with it, on the face of their building says, this is a King James only church or on the How website. How does the mantra go page. when you're saying, we're a 
King James only church. No, but no. you got to say the whole. You got to. There's like uh, five things. There's like five things the to say in a row. Independent, fundamental, KJV only, Bible patriarchal, <laughs> premillennial, etc. Yeah, yeah okay. Bible believing. I stomping. just wanted to make sure that was a thing. Biscuit dripping, <laughs> gravy slopping Baptist church. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's a stereotype. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, I gotta come back from biscuit dripping. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but yeah, now that we're back from uh, our laugh break, uh, yeah. So the uh, the KJV only is definitely a big thing. I've heard some churches go as far as to say that the King James is the only inspired version. That even if you're going to another language, you use the KJV. Yeah, that's why uh, you don't look at the Greek, you don't look at the Hebrew, you look at the King James version. I'm, I'm sure not everybody believes that. Uh, not that, everyone that, believes it. That some, sounds some believe there. it's the best version, so why not use the best? I would disagree with that. But some do believe it's re-inspired is what they call it. Yeah, that's wild. It like is. to say that if we were going to go to an unreached people group that doesn't have a copy of the Bible and we were going to translate their language from the King James English mm-hmm. rather than from the Greek and Hebrew, you're out there on an island with right, that. Right. Okay. Um, always pre-millennial. True or false? Yes, always. You ever run into an amillennial or post-millennial I fundamental? never even heard of that until I was out of uh, the circle of uh, independent fundamental Baptist. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So rapture view yeah. 100% of the time. Pre, pre-trib. Pre-everything. Yeah. Basically, uh, take left behind and slap it on a piece of okay. paper. And it's left. Got gotcha. you. Left behind. Mm-hmm. Um, I ha- How would you say the view toward education and intellect because i in my mind there's a negative view towards like degrees and and uh having education and things like that it it would depend on who you ask and sometimes they do have a point like some will say like i'd rather know scripture than have a super nice degree and i 100 percent you know believe i'd rather have all scripture memorized uh than have three doctorates and you know theology Mm -hmm. uh but uh Some do value education. Like I believe the school that we grew up in definitely valued our education. And I think we were taught very well and better off for it. Uh, But I've also heard them say, you know, pastors don't need to get masters. Pastors don't need to get doctors. Just get in there and preach. Okay. Uh, And that may be what I'm thinking of. Pros and cons to it. But yeah, you're right. All right. What about, um, all right. I just have this line. Yeah. Tell me true or false. Compromise is the chief sin. Oh yeah. Don't compromise. Which we would agree. Don't compromise. But yeah. What does that mean? Now. What do you think that, what does that mean to you? I mean, I've heard online, just listening to random preachers, I've heard them say like someone's compromising. If, you know, a woman's out wearing jeans in public, she's compromising to our culture or okay. something like that. But also some might be, well, they support, you know, homosexuality. So they're compromising and I right. agree. Which actually that. is a compromise. Right. Yeah. Mm. So it is hard cause it can be made to mean almost anything. Right. And, um, yeah, I, uh, I, you know, when I was kind of prepping for this, I was listening to some of the sermons that you, you know, mm. had sent me, you know, I want to know this guy, know this guy. I heard that word come up like a constantly mm-hmm. the, about compromise. Right. So clearly that's their view of the, and that pervaded the preaching of yeah. like, when you go to the preaching, the topics were all very similar and that it was about not compromising to the trends of the world. It's always a battle, us versus the world, us versus the world. And it, it is... But when that's all you focus on, sometimes it gets overwhelming yeah. and overstated. Do you think sometimes, even though they're literal guys, do you think that they will twist text to make it about that when it's not? Uh, yes. Like they want to get to the the comp to the compromise discussion yeah. on every sermon. Yeah, I've, I've yeah I've heard some crazy sermons. Okay, on that. So. Um, here's what I think is maybe. The, the define for me, for Jared Kress, the defining what fundamentalism is today in, in the new de- definition of it to me is that all issues are equally important. So that, I just wrote down all issues are equally important, but I think that's so like for a, a fundamentalist, there's no strata of 
like this is more important than that. This is I can let that go. You I can't fellowship with you over this, but you're probably still saved. Like I have a three tiered system in my in my head of like the tight things, the fundamentals, if you will. That like you may not be saved if you if you don't believe these. Like these are really important. You, you can't be saved if you don't believe Jesus rose from the dead. I'm holding that tight. Then there's sort of things that's like we disagree on that, but I don't think it means you're not saved. Right. So you know like. In time beliefs. And and, uh, I didn't even put that in the third one. Like, yeah. uh, say like tongues, someone okay. that someone that you have to speak in tongues. I would say I really disagree with that. Okay. But I think there are some people that believe that that are saved. Okay. Um, and then, but I don't want to worship in that church. I think we need to have separate churches. Okay. Yeah. And then there's another layer for me that's like, I, we disagree on that and we can still go to the same church. Okay. Yeah. Like okay. end times. Then that's end times. Yeah. So. Um, I don't, I don't need everybody in my church to believe the exact chart about the ending is me. Right. So I can stratify those things of importance. My experience with fundamentalist is that it all gets smushed down into one flat line and everything is equally important. And if you, so like the resurrection, I'm, I'm making a joke a little bit, the resurrection of Jesus and wearing a suit and tie are like extremely like, yeah. it's hard to say I've, which one's more important. Yeah. I've, n- I've never <laughs> thought of it like that or seen it that way, but I think you definitely have a point that uh, they'll argue with you just as much over, you know, King James only as, well, I believe the Bible is true. Right. So, Which are not the same. Like, let that go. Let yeah. let the King James thing go. It, it, it's not nearly as important as the inerrancy. Right. So. You're out if you disagree with Yeah. If you, if you disagree with one of those, any one of those little points, Boom! It's over. Right. You, you you've you've missed the checklist of all these items. To me, that might be like an essence of of the discussion on fundamentalism. So, anyway, moving along, uh, associations are extremely important. So, like who you hang out with, and who that yeah. person hung out with, and who that person hung out with. So yeah, like, and I think to an extent, I mean, they have a point. It is wise to hang around the right people and be around the right people. But when you get to the extreme of, I won't even you know, sit and talk to this person. Like, you know, Jesus hung out and ate with sinners and saints. So, uh, right. Yeah. Like I'm going to ask Aaron to preach, but I saw Aaron go into Torchy's tacos and he has a, (laughs) you know, and he has a friend who's the manager there. And that guy, you know, once took a drink of alcohol and I saw it it, like, okay, you start going down the line Mm -hmm. and it's like, yeah, for sure. And that's your fault because you hung out with a guy who knows a guy who platformed a guy. I know some that's fundamentalism a little bit to me. Yeah. Um, last couple things on my list. I've got just old timey, old fashioned. Give me that old time religion. The old time religion. Uh, like I, I call it like, it's almost like arrested development to me. Like, um, when someone experiences like a trauma and they're stuck in a, in a, a decade of their life, it seems like they're stuck in the twenties sometimes or the fifties yeah. or whatever decade their, their mm-hmm. church has chosen to be in. Um, so last one that I would say is, uh, they have landmarkist tendencies. Now, a lot of people don't know what that word means, and I wouldn't apply this to every one of them probably, but mm-hmm. to be a landmarkist means that you think your tradition of church is directly tied to the original apostles, and it's separate from the Catholic Church and the Reformers. Mm. So like you have a separate stream that is run parallel, but not touching yeah. those things. So a lot of a lot of independent fundamental Baptists will say, um, when you say things like, our forefathers of the Reformation, like when Martin mm. Luther did that, you know, he helped us in this way, they'll say, hey, he's not my forefather. I'm an Anabaptist guy. We came from the Anabaptist, and they, and then from the yeah. Donatists, and from the Waldensians, and they've got the trail, the J.M. Carroll Trail of mm-hmm. Blood that's never touched any of that. Yeah, and I would say that that might be majority true. I, I do think they're fundamental Baptists who are not landmarkists, and I believe they're landmarkists who are not independent Baptists. But I do see how there could be definitely a crossover. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start ramping us down here. Okay. Um, my my main problem, I'm going to give a negative and then a positive, and then I'm going to get you to answer your your three questions that I asked you to prep for. All okay. this other was extemporaneous. All right. I think the problem 
with most everything that we've talked about is it all lands for me in the category of external behavior modification. Um, this is sort of like, it has very little to do. It looks more to me like the Pharisees than it does with the ministry of Christ. Mm. And, um, so those are negative things to me. Like, I, I think that a lot of those things are, we don't even need to make, we're making mountains out of molehills and most of what we just talked about. Um, though we agree on the same, we're missing those awesome fundamentals in the beginning. Yeah. We're missing all the good doctrine that's actually buried in order to get for people in order to get through to the resurrection of Christ, the substitutionary atonement, the virgin birth, the miracles, the script inerrancy of scripture, you gotta, you gotta wade through cards and rock music and KJV and pre millennial right. and, and you know, all these things. It's like, man, that's, you're missing the one for the other. Mm. So to me, that's the negative. Um, but the positive is that even though uh, this group has sort of been like a powerful restraint on sin, I would imagine, in our culture, like there are some positive things mm -hmm. that have come from it. Um, so anyway, I want to get your opinion. Close us out. What do you think? I gave you three questions. All right? The first one was, in what ways do you think we, the SBC, have been impacted by fundamentalism for better or for worse? Well, I think, uh, especially with what we mentioned earlier, uh, with the seventies and the beginning of the conservative resurgence and all that, uh, I do believe, uh, that our conservative heritage, uh, kind of has somewhere to hold on to. And when, uh, fundamentalism really began ramping up. So, you know, I think a lot of our conservative values, uh, are more instated and, uh, they're seen really being pushed. Uh, by the beginning of that fundamentalist movement. Uh, so I, I believe that, that that big stance, like this is what we will believe and you're not going to change us. We believe in the inerrancy of scripture. We believe in all these other things, the virgin birth, the substitutionary atonement. I think that's had a very strong stance that, hey, we can get together and stand up for these fundamentals of scripture. Uh, so the backbone maybe got transferred to the SBC yeah, in some ways, but again, perhaps the uh, extreme side of things, uh, all the external things, the cards and the rock music, etc. Yeah, uh, and I can appreciate their backbone mm -hmm. it, as someone who has to stand for things. Right, I appreciate somebody that's willing to stand up and take a position and say, "You're not going to budge me off of this. I'll right. I'll die before I change this." Right. I can appreciate that. So mm -hmm. I just I don't agree on a lot of those smaller issues. Right. All right. Second question. What are the key differences that you think are, exist between us and them? If you mean us and them by fundamentalism, uh, I would say hopefully not much. Uh, I hope that we are fundamentalists. I hope we believe in the fundamentals. Uh, but if you mean us and the stereotypical fundamentalist, uh, obviously, uh, like you're talking about how often they can resemble uh, Pharisees to some extent. A lot of the external things, uh, I think a lot more Southern Baptists uh, have a lot more grace when it comes to that area. Like, let's change the heart of the person, and then the outside will change, uh, versus, hey, I just care that you change the outside, and I'm sure your heart will change as well. Okay. Last question. Tie a pink bow on it for me. Okay. Do you think Fundamental Baptist, the movement, okay. has been a net positive or net negative for the kingdom? I would say, I would say it's been a net positive. Uh, I think any time. So, so I think the, the sweet spot, of course, if, uh, which really moderate in the SBC is more liberal, but like the more liberal side of things is one extreme and then whatever conservative is, is like super conservative, like super independent, fundamental, stereotypical conservative is the other extreme. I think the sweet spot is more so in the middle and closer to the fundamentalist. So I would say that typically just the way that, you know, organizations work and the way that, um, you know, the culture works is that it will land somewhere in the middle. So if we never had those extreme, super like, we're going like adding stuff to the law of scripture and all these stereotypical things. If we didn't have that, I would be afraid that 
the meeting point of where Christianity is today would be even further liberal than it is now. So I think they really moved the middle, like the stereotypical Christianity. This is the middle of what Christians believe a lot more conservative than it would have been if the movement never happened. If we never stood up against evolution, if we never stood up against the abuse of alcohol, if we never stood up against liberalism, the SBC, then I think things would be a lot worse off. You've got like a tug of war picture. Yeah, like in your a tug mind. of war going on in my mind. And I'm glad that you we need have someone pulling that that right yeah. side. Though I would not agree with the extreme, extreme conservative side. Mm-hmm. I'm glad that they're pulling the rope closer toward conservatism. Okay. I can see that. Good. Mm-hmm. Well, my my thought is that I think it probably has been a net positive. It really I I you say it easier than I do. I feel mm-hmm. like I miss I don't know enough to answer it, but I do think that's probably true. Um I, I'm I'm glad that there's somebody fighting uh, and pushing and holding the rope on that end too. Mm-hmm. Um what I don't think most SBC folks know is how much this has affected their mind. And it's, it's a part of the SBC, whether you want to know it or not. And any pastor of an SBC church who has senior adult members or, you know, middle age and up members like this, this is in them. Yeah. It's been, it's in them somewhere. This is more of what people grew up with um, than what is, what kids are growing up today in an SBC church is very different than what kids 60 years ago grew up with that was more fundamentalist than today. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people probably grew up in a church that we described that's Mm -hmm. exactly like that. And they don't really have much negative to say about it because it was pretty much positive. The people were sweet. The Mm -hmm. uh, music, you know, was hymns. They knew the songs. Um, You know, they understood what their church was asking of them and it wasn't a huge deal. They believed the Bible. And uh, so that's a good thing. All those are good things. Um, I just think it's much more prone to the abuses of Phariseeism and much more prone to worry so much about these external behaviors that you miss sort of the tenderness of the gospel that touches the heart and seeks to, you know, that, that grace, mercy and forgiveness peace that's necessary, the love of God, all those things that sometimes can get abused on the other side too. Uh, those, those need to be there and present because it makes it, makes it about Jesus and the gospel. So, um, anyway, I wanted to explore that today. I hope y'all thought that was somewhat interesting, a little different throw, uh, the lingering effects that fundamental fundamentalism has, uh, on the SBC, uh, share this podcast with a friend if you thought it was interesting and we'll catch y'all next time for off script.